For the first time, researchers have detected and measured microplastics in freshly fallen Antarctic snow and the source of these particulate pollutant matter is at least partly the research stations in Antarctica themselves and the researchers too who conduct precisely these kind of studies. The microplastics likely came from the clothing gear and equipment and other bits of human footprint and human activity associated items just from research stations in Antarctica. Well, at least partly. Some particulate matter, microplastics, is thought to have come from other parts of the world through, of course, air currents. But what does it mean that freshly fallen snow in an extremely remote continent actually shows evidence of particulate pollution fallen from the sky? And what is the consequence for Antarctica specifically, considering it is such an important research location? Also, how do the authors determine that it was freshly fallen snow that contained microplastics? The last question is easy to answer. One day before the team went to pick up samples, there was fresh snowfall, just a few hours prior to sampling. The reason the researchers are intent on studying the effects of pollution in Antarctica is that it is relatively isolated and insulated from the rest of the world and dense anthropogenic activity. Of course, the continent and this ecosystem is not completely cut off. All global systems interact with each other. But Antarctica is often used as a measure for quantifying the minimum amount of maximum damage we've done because whatever is detectable here would typically be much, much lower than the rest of the world, especially the Northern Hemisphere. Antarctica is still a very pristine environment and it is extremely remote. So Antarctica can act as an indicator of physical, chemical and biological effects that are caused by anthropogenic stresses. Findings from the southern ocean around Antarctica have been steadily showing an increasing concentration of microplastics as do the rest of the water bodies on the planet. And microplastics have also been detected in freshwater samples taken in the Antarctic region. So scientists are familiar with microplastic quantification and the extent of pollution in the oceans, to a fair degree. What's more, we also know that our numbers are not accurate because we are limited by the technology that we use. There's particles only so small that our tech can quantify. Anything smaller than that, scientists simply cannot detect because there's no equipment for it. The smallest particle scientists can reportedly detect today is 1.6 micrometers, but we already know that particles, microplastic particles smaller than this definitely exist because all pieces of plastic degrade into smaller pieces. The team collected samples of fresh snow from 19 sites across the Ross Island region of Antarctica, where it had snowed just a day prior. To no one's surprise, the team discovered that there were microplastic particles in every single sample that they took. There was an average of 29 particles per litre of snow, and this concentration is not much when compared to what we find in the oceans and environments in the Northern Hemisphere, but this is a very, very big deal for Antarctica. The concentration is three times higher than other research stations on the continent, including scientific bases like the Scott Base or McMurdo Station. The researchers found that there were 13 types of plastic that were found in these samples, and the most common of them was PET, which is of course used to make things like polymer resin, fibers in our clothing, and the PET bottle. The findings also confirmed what everyone in the scientific community has been expecting and already knows. It is absolutely impossible to be completely free of plastic in the environment outside in any part of the world. All of this comes from human activity and every part of the world and every single organism is affected. The team analyzed where these airborne particles might have come from and calculated their back trajectories, the air currents and circulation patterns that would have brought these particles to Antarctica, to this region. But apart from these air currents and sources from other parts of the world, the researchers also determined that a major source of the contamination was the research stations in Antarctica themselves. The particles were consistent with those that were used in clothing and equipment from the research stations here. 
any form of human activity does lead to plastic leaking into the environment and sterilized sturdy hardy research equipment definitely contains lots of plastic even the clothing that the scientists themselves wore while sampling was also analyzed for potential sources of contamination the authors mentioned that these high numbers are actually just basic readings and the actual quantity of microplastics is likely to be much higher of course we don't have the tech for it and they have not sampled enough these findings are new and the authors say that to confirm and fine tune their findings this study needs to be replicated to obtain a more accurate image of microplastic contamination in the antarctic Plastic contamination occurs from various sources that we cannot even imagine at times. Anything made of plastic or synthetic polymers tends to degrade very very slowly. For example, one of the largest sources of microplastics is actually laundry that we do at home. Synthetic fibers used in our clothes shed when washing clothes, whether by hand or machine, and eventually all of these end up in the oceans where they poison marine life. that of course present in food packaging all around us food takeaway is covered in plastic a lot of our household cutlery is plastic and in fact even things like cutting board or nonstick pans or knife handles are also sources of microplastic when we wash them and they go into our food there's of course skin care and personal hygiene products as well Microbeads are common in anything that is exfoliating and which scrubs the skin and these are small tiny beads of plastic that once again end up in the ocean and poison fish after we wash our clear faces. Nurdles which are pre-production plastic pellets are very small and are perhaps the biggest culprit ever at the root of everything plastic pollution. They are microplastics and these are the basic structure that makes up most of our everyday plastic items including single use bags, sturdy chairs and furniture, lids on our laptops, pipes in our buildings, automobile parts, wiring, clothing and literally anything a person can think of that contains plastic. Nurdles are like small Lego pieces that can be used to build larger plastic structures and in this case plastic objects of any shape size and sturdiness. Nurdles also absorb harmful organic pollutants and retain them polluting the environment that they're in. And plastic also degrades over hundreds of thousands of years. So every bit of plastic is constantly getting eroded into smaller and smaller pieces of plastic over hundreds of years. These eroded particles get tinier and tinier and affect smaller and smaller forms of life and this then compounds the negative effect by climbing up the food chain in a process that is called biomagnification or bioamplification. Microplastics also cross from water to air to land or soil in a process that is called the plastic cycle. The plastic cycle is often considered to be a part of the carbon cycle and it is defined as the continuous and persistent movement of plastic particles between biotic and abiotic ecosystems including within human bodies. At this point, most of us know that microplastics are everywhere. They are in the oceans, they are at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, they are present at the summit of Mount Everest, they are present at both the poles, they are present inside the bodies of animals and humans, they are present in our bloodstream, they are present in the human placenta and in newborns, they are in the food we eat and the beer we drink, they are inside of the plants around us and they are in the very air that we breathe into our lungs every day. So what else is left? Even pathogens and parasites can in fact ride these particles of microplastic and spread in an environment as can other harmful toxins and pollutants. If these broke down and disappeared quickly and get absorbed into the environment harmlessly, we wouldn't be worrying as much. But plastic persists in the environment for hundreds of years. By now we also know that plastic recycling is a big oil myth. Just about 6 to 9% of all plastic products manufactured to date have been recycled. There isn't much recycling happening and there isn't much to do in terms of damage already occurred. We know that it's too late to fix all the plastic that is already out in the environment. But 
Lowering plastic production and use and actually recycling would at least help cut down future buildup of plastic in our environments. Plastics have invaded our lives so much and we are just beginning to quantify the sheer amount of microplastics we have ourselves put into the environment in the last, what, 120 years or so. Going forward, we're going to start seeing more and more research on how these microplastics interact with our bodies, our cells, with other animals and plant life, and with the local environment that they're in, and the plastics, so it's just not really going to be much good news.